Donald Trump's campaign divides Republicans, why some people are slow to show their support. Hillary Clinton sets her sights on the general, even though Bernie Sanders says he's staying in the race. People in Italy march for life, how the pro-life movement is expanding overseas. And more protests centered on North Carolina's gender-based law, why the state is suing the federal government, on EWTN News Nightly for Monday, May 9th, 2016. Good evening, and thank you for joining us. I'm Lauren Ashburn. A potentially epic clash over transgender rights is taking shape in North Carolina as the federal government and the state sue each other over a new bathroom law. That law requires transgender people to use the public restroom matching the sex on their birth certificate. Wyatt Goolsby is in Washington with the latest. Wyatt? Lauren, the Department of Justice is not backing down on their position against the North Carolina law. Attorney General Loretta Lynch saying this is state-sponsored discrimination against transgender people. The Department of Justice and indeed the entire Obama administration want you to know that we see you, we stand with you, and we will do everything we can to protect you going forward. Loretta Lynch has a warning to Governor Pat McRory, do not enforce his state's new law. Late this afternoon, Lynch announced the federal government is taking its own legal action against North Carolina, one that could cut off billions of dollars in federal money flowing to the state. But McRory is fighting back. I do not agree with their interpretation of federal law. He says the Civil Rights Act does not say anything about gender identity. He calls the Justice Department's position a blatant overreach. Today he asked a federal court to weigh in. This is not just a North Carolina issue. This is now a national issue. North Carolina lawmakers passed House Bill 2 in March. The law says in public restrooms and locker rooms, transgender people must use the facility matching the sex on their birth certificate. Supporters of the bill call it a common sense policy. There's an assumption that when you go into a man's room or a women's room, that that's who's going to be in there. But we're really talking about just going to the practice that has been happening in North Carolina and probably every other state in the nation for most of the history of this nation. Not everyone in North Carolina agrees, but McRory is calling for support from states that do. Roger Severino at the Heritage Foundation says that very likely could happen. Wherever the Department of Justice has moved to threaten with revocation of federal funds, you have a real issue there. You could do the same thing that North Carolina did here and ask a federal judge to require the Department of Justice to back off. In response today, the White House is calling the law uh, unfair. They actually say this is inconsistent with the values of fairness and equality and justice. Lauren? Wyatt Goolsby in Washington. Thank you, Wyatt. The ACLU is suing Mississippi over a state law that allows businesses to deny services to gay and lesbian people based on religious objections. Supporters say the law protects people's beliefs that marriage should only be between a man and a woman. Opponents say it violates the equal protection guarantee of the Constitution. Other stories our EWTN News Nightly team is covering in today's world. Speaker of the House Paul Ryan says he'll step down as chair of the Republican National Convention. That's if Donald Trump wants him to do that. And in the Democratic race, Hillary Clinton faces Bernie Sanders in a West Virginia primary tomorrow. But she's already campaigning in a battleground state for the general election. And that's where Jason Calvi is tonight. Jason. Lauren, Hillary stopped at Mug and Muffin. It's a small coffee shop here in Northern Virginia. It follows in the wake of Donald Trump blasting her for her husband's sexual scandals in the White House. When asked about that today here, she says she has nothing to say about Trump or his campaign. Hi. Hi. Hillary Clinton answers questions from women and families. When you're cutting higher ed and you are shutting labs and shutting research projects and doing it with scholarship and other kinds of uh, financial help for students, you're also really undermining the potential for your economic development. Here in Virginia, Clinton is trying to sway women on issues that are important to them. Her likely opponent, Donald Trump, calls Hillary a nasty, mean enabler of her husband's infidelity. And Hillary, if you look and see you study, Hillary hurt many women, the women that he abused. She's married to a man 
who got impeached for lying. Trump's attack comes a few days after Speaker Ryan announced he's not yet ready to support the billionaire businessman. Trump supporter Sarah Palin is working to oust Ryan in his Republican primary campaign. Paul Ryan and his ilk, their problem is they have become so disconnected from the people whom they are elected to represent, as evidenced by Paul Ryan's refusal to support the GOP front runner that we just said he's our man. Trump tells CNN he was blindsided by Speaker Ryan, but backed away from Palin's comments. I have nothing to do with that. I mean, that's her, you know, Sarah is very much a free agent. And the head of the Southern Baptist Convention's Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission says, faced with the Trump-Clinton option, he says many conservative Christians are going to either sit out this fall or vote third party. Lauren? Well, what's on the agenda for the meeting between Trump, Ryan, and other congressional Republicans on Thursday? Learn, don't expect them to be instant friends. Uh, Speaker Ryan has two meetings with Trump, one with Republican House leadership and the second meeting with the chairman of the Republican National Committee. Uh, this may indicate, Lauren, the need for a mediator in what could be very tense meetings. Jason Calvi reporting in Northern Virginia. Jason, thank you. Bernie Sanders says he's still in despite his long odds. The Vermont senator said he has high hopes for tomorrow's West Virginia primary. The Real Clear Politics poll average favors Clinton 46 to 40 percent. The chairman of the DNC host committee says his supporters have to behave themselves if the Vermont senator loses the nomination. If we can win here in New Jersey and win in California and win in some of the other states, and if we can win a majority of the pledged delegates, we're going to go into Philadelphia and the Democratic Convention. Sanders would have to win 66 percent of the remaining pledged delegates to have a chance to win the Democratic nomination. And a change in tactics for Donald Trump. He's seeking campaign cash. Trump self-funded most of his primary campaign, but now he wants donations for the general election. I'm self-funding, so it's a big difference, folks. I don't care. I'm going to do what's right for you. Donald Trump could be saying so long to self-funding. So far, I'm in for like 40 or $45 million. Facing an expensive general election battle, the GOP frontrunner is now opening the door to raising cash for his hey, campaign and the Republican Party. Yep. I do love self-funding, and I, I don't want anything for myself, but we do need money for the party. I'll be asking money for the party, and really it's something that we're going to start on right away. This is setting off a scramble to secure support from the deep-pocketed donors within the GOP. Donald Trump will be good for us. Trump getting a major nod from the single largest Republican contributor from 2012, casino magnate Sheldon Adelson, one of the richest men in the world. Yes, I'm a Republican. He's a Republican. He's our nominee. Whoever the nominee would turn out to be, any one of the 17, and he's one of the 17, he won fair and square. Throughout the primary, though, Trump publicly trashed wealthy donors, even calling some by name. A guy named Singer. Who the hell ever heard of him? I'll tell you, I'll tell you a little secret. I saw, I was surprised because I thought I was friends Koch brothers. I thought I was their friend. But somebody said they're linked to a certain pack. Decrying their influence over certain politicians. When their special interest calls, when their lobbyist calls, when their donors call and they have a stake in a deal, they're not going to do what's right for you. I didn't take any money. But now as the presumptive GOP nominee, Trump is hitting some roadblocks with Republican rainmakers. According to a survey done by CNN, a substantial number of other big money Republican donors are sitting on the sidelines, withholding their money from Trump, including the mega wealthy Koch brothers. On some of the Republican candidates, we would, before we could support them, we'd have to believe their actions will be quite different than the rhetoric we've heard so far. Many donors now are planning to redirect their money elsewhere, investing in down-ballot races to help Republicans in Senate, House, and gubernatorial races instead. The biggest challenge uh, in that sense is going up against a very well-funded opposition. Not only does Hillary Clinton have a ready and able fundraising machine, but so many of the, Democrat, the, the Democratic outside groups, the DNC, 
Um, so you put all of those together, and it is a formidable opposition. In the past, Republican nominees have created a joint account with the RNC. That way, they raise money for the campaign as well as the national and state parties. The RNC still hasn't announced if it will financially cooperate with Donald Trump. Gregory Cordy is the White House correspondent for USA Today. Well, we've covered a lot of ground here. Two big battles, Trump and Ryan, and in North Carolina, the Obama administration versus North Carolina. On that one, what's really going on? Well, this is going to be a big, the next big frontier in constitutional law. I think, you know, you have a, an issue of civil rights law, but there's also an issue of federalism here. And so what you saw today was the uh, state of North Carolina suing the federal government to preempt the inevitable lawsuit that they knew that was going to come from the Justice <laughs> Department, which did come later in the day. Yeah, well, and so we, we were, they're fighting this on two battles now. Right, but you were in Cincinnati, you, we were talking yeah. earlier off camera, where you covered law, things like that, similar to this. Explain that a, bit, a little bit. Yeah, well, the, there is a, a long history of uh, these kinds of ordinances either prohibiting uh, discrimination uh, on the basis of sexual orientation or uh, prohibiting any ordinance from uh, prohibiting discrimination. And so states come in and they try to preempt those. And now what we have is the next iteration of that where the federal government, see if you can follow this, yeah, that's right. is trying to overturn the state, trying to overturn Turn Charlotte's right. law. Uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. Charlotte, law. yeah, mm -hmm. uh, passed an ordinance uh, trying to protect uh, gays and lesbians what from discrimination. Is, what is the impact going to have of this? It's going to have an impact across the country, isn't it? The, Governor McCrory in, in North Carolina is uh, making that that uh, that uh, point that this is not just about North Carolina. If, if the standard that the Justice Department is trying to enforce against North Carolina, we're enforcing or enforce against everybody, that, that would affect the bathroom policies of every government and every company of more than 15 people uh, anywhere in the country. Um, and there has been some state backlash here, and we've seen that in other states, like Oxford, Alabama, for example. If you can face six months in jail for using the restroom for the gender that um, they identify with. Do we expect to see more or less of these as a result of the lawsuit? That I, I can't say. What I will say is it is an election year. Uh -huh. And there is a long history of people on, you know, activists on both sides, really, uh, using these moral wedge issues in an election year to really kind of get their base out to vote. You see it on abortion. You see it on gay rights, gay marriage uh, in the past. States have put these, uh, uh, passed these laws. And so it, we're really sort of ginned up for this battle right this year. Yeah. Gregory Cordy, White House correspondent, USA Today. Thank you for joining Thank you. us. Londoners elect their first Muslim mayor. I never dreamt that someone like me could be elected as mayor of London. Sadiq Khan grew up near London and is the first Muslim mayor of a Western capital. He calls London the greatest city in the world. Voters in the Philippines cast their ballots in the country's presidential election. A controversial mayor is considered the front runner. Church leaders encourage voters to think of Christ as they decide on who to vote for. Thousands of people gathered in Rome for Italy's sixth annual March for Life on Sunday. Marchers came from nearly 30 different countries to protest abortion. This year's theme was For Life Without Compromises. The pro-life event included singing and bagpipes and ended in St. Peter's Square where Pope Francis greeted the marchers. Most participants are Catholic, but the event is not officially Catholic. Ed Penton is the Rome correspondent for the National Catholic Register. He joins us now. Ed. How much has Italy's march grown over the years? Well, it started uh, quite modestly, Lauren, in 2011, and since then uh, they've grown quite a bit. Uh, it's not really part of their culture to have marches in this sort of uh, in this sort of vein, but they they've got used to it, and uh, they're having it every year now in Rome. It didn't start in Rome; it started in the north of Italy, but now it's moved to Rome, and they get regularly, I'd say, between six and ten thousand uh, participants every year. Can you give us an idea of what that pro-life movement in all of Europe is like? Yes, um, on the whole, Lauren, it's pretty bad, really. I mean, I was talking to a pro-life leader just a few minutes ago, and he was saying that it's a, it's a terrible situation. But he did say that there are some exceptions, and those exceptions are in Poland, uh, particularly in Holland and Russia, of course, where uh, they've actually voted to, um, the governments have voted to abolish abortion. Um, and so that's a very hopeful sign. And uh, he said that basically the answer is, is for pro-life leaders to vote in pro-life governments, and that's the key. Uh, it's, to, it's to make sure that the voters vote in those who are pro-life so that these changes can be made. 
Well, here in the United States, it's pretty much evenly divided, as you know, pro-life versus pro-abortion. Are, do you think, activists in Europe taking cues from the U.S.? Very much so, yes. And I think uh, this whole pro, this whole March for Life uh, aspect of the pro-life movement it comes directly from the United States. Um, and there's a great sense that uh, the way the United States goes on this on this issue and on the culture wars in general energizes uh, over those over here in Europe. So there's a great um, a great sense that the U.S. takes the lead in this because uh, there's a great sense of being unashamed of these issues over there, and that's uh, and there's a certain amount of shame over here in Europe. But if that uh, if that's taken away, then uh, people feel a lot more confident over here and take their example from the U.S. Ed Penton, Rome correspondent for the National Catholic Register, thank you for joining us. Thanks, Lauren. Coming up, outrage over what's being called an honor killing. What led to a Pakistani teenage girl's death. And the Pope offers to intervene in Venezuela, where power outages reflect even bigger problems. La Festa de la Mama. Pope Francis wishing mothers around the world a happy Mother's Day yesterday. The Holy Father invited the crowd to join him in praying the Hail Mary for all mothers. Thank you for joining us this evening. I'm Lauren Ashburn. Canada plans the return of tens of thousands of people who fled a massive wildfire. Alberta government officials say the fire destroyed nearly half a million acres so far. The forecast predicts cooler temperatures. Firefighters hope to put out the remaining hotspots. A Vatican news agency says a Protestant minister in China has been axed to death for helping North Korean refugees. Reverend Han had built a church on the Chinese side of a mountain range on the border with North Korea. And a horrific murder in Pakistan of a 15-year-old girl. It's being called an honor killing. Her crime, allegedly attempting to help a friend elope. A horrific crime committed in some warped idea of honor. A 15-year-old girl murdered her charred skeleton found in a village in northern Pakistan last week. This was not a jirga of elders. It was a jirga of local hoodlums and ruffians who wanted to take revenge for the dishonor of the family. Authorities say the girl, whose name was Ambreen, helped a female friend elope with her boyfriend. The couple escaped, but police say a local tribal council, or jirga, ordered Ambreen's execution. Authorities say some of those council members carried out the killing, sedating and suffocating the girl, then tying her body to a van, setting it on fire. More than a dozen people are now under arrest, including the victim's mother, who investigators say knew about the order to kill her daughter, but did nothing to stop it or call police. Pakistan's prime minister condemned the brutal crime in a statement saying, such a barbaric act is not only un-Islamic, but also inhuman. It is not honor killing, it's just plain murder. I think this is a tip of the iceberg because a lot of these numbers are coming out of the reported cases, so I think if you look at the scale of the problem, actually we don't know. Hundreds of girls are killed by relatives every year in Pakistan, according to the country's Independent Human Rights Commission. And experts believe many of these murders go unreported. The suspects under arrest for Ambreen's murder now face trial. But human rights advocates caution few of these kinds of cases go to court. For many, justice remains elusive. For months, the economy in Venezuela has been in a free fall, and Pope Francis is expressing concern. President Nicolas Maduro has issued mandatory daily blackouts in many major cities. People line up for hours just for food, and hospitals are rationing medicines and supplies. The dire situation is drawing international attention. Last month, the Vatican confirms the Holy Father sent a letter to the president about it. The Pope has in the past offered to serve as a mediator between Venezuela's political factions. Pedestrians take over the Champs-Élysées as part of a new tradition to ban traffic on the famous Paris Avenue once a month. Tourists basked in the sun yesterday as the temperature hit 80 degrees. The initiative is aimed at reducing pollution in the French capital. The city has already tried to cut pollution levels by introducing rental bicycles, adding bike paths, and adopting a fleet of electric cars. Up next, growing concern over a gay rights agenda. Bishop Victor Marsayas describes the issue facing the Dominican Republic. And Kentucky Derby winner, meet the horse galloping toward the Triple Crown. A 
handwritten Instagram message on World Communications Day from Pope Francis. To you, who from the great digital community ask for my prayers and blessings, I wish to say that you will be the precious gift in my prayer to the Father. Thank you for joining us this evening. I'm Lauren Ashburn. A bishop in the Dominican Republic accuses the U.S. ambassador of pushing a gay rights agenda. He says Ambassador James Brewster is pressuring the local government to change the Constitution. Bishop Victor Masayas is Auxiliary Bishop in the Archdiocese of Santo Domingo in the Dominican Republic. He joins us from Madrid, Spain. Your Excellency, what are your concerns? Well, in Dominican Republic, yeah, we, we are having problems actually with the uh, with, uh, American Embassy, not with the American Embassy, especially with the Ambassador of the United States of America in Dominican Republic. He came as an ambassador, but he really is an activist, a gay activist. We are not having problem because he is a gay, but he's doing uh, activism in Dominican Republic, and he's, this is against our culture and our traditions. He was doing a uh, speech in in the Chamber of Commerce, and he was telling to the people that the, if somebody is, he doesn't agree with what he is talking about, he has to return the visa. So that would mean that Dominicans who don't agree with him, he says, would be punished by the U.S. government? Yeah, yes, exactly. And Dominican, Dominicans have had a visa. For them, it's very important to stay with the visa. But when you say you have to return the visa if you don't agree with me, that is a sort of extortion to the society trying to, to impose uh, the, the agenda. And that's, it's hard for, for the, we are, we are suffering that situation in Dominican Republic as a people, as a country. Bishop Victor Marseilles, Auxiliary Bishop in the Archdiocese of Santo Domingo, thank you for joining us. And Dr. Matthew Bunsen is a historian and theologian with Catholic Distance University. Let's clear up a few things about this and we'll get to the administration's response to this in a moment. Pope Francis often talks about ideological colonization. He does. Yes, let's explain what that is and how it's related to this case in particular. Right. Well, the popes have been concerned for a number of decades about the imposition by the developing world, in particular the Western countries, the United Nation agencies, and even the United States, and imposing a set of values on developing countries. Much as we used to have old-style colonialism or imperialism, what this does is it imposes a set of values, for example, same-sex marriage, abortion rights, and other things onto the developing world, and it does it by withholding or threatening to withhold benefits, uh, rights, uh, money, aid, water, medicine, uh, until that agenda is accepted. Pope Francis actually uh, gave us an example of that on his flight back from the Philippines uh, last year, in which he talked about a woman who was trying to build schools in Argentina who desperately needed money, and the money was offered as long as she accepted a series of textbooks that advanced a gender theory. Okay, so Secretary Kerry last year, let's take a, a look here, we're gonna put up a full screen. Defending, he says, defending and promoting the human rights of LGBT persons is that the core of our commitment to advancing human rights globally. Now, he didn't talk specifically about this case. Based on this, what role do gay rights have in our foreign policy? Well, the uh, State Department and the Obama administration has made uh, the advancement of gay rights one of its highest priorities in terms of its international diplomacy. One of the ways that we know that is that uh, in 2015 they established a special envoy for the advancement of LGBT rights globally. Uh, the administration itself has been promoting wherever possible the rights of, of gay persons. But we also have to be aware that this is part of a wider effort on the part of the administration. They have uh, a, actually stopped using the term LGBT rights in favor of what they're now referring to as sexual rights that involves as well what they refer to as reproductive rights. So they're basically pulling together LGBT activity as well as uh, pro-abortion agenda. This is part, in a way, I think, of what we're talking about with ideological colonization. Okay. Dr. Matthew Bunsen, Catholic Distance University, thank you so much for joining Great us. Great to be with you. And the winner is Nyquist. The odds-on favorite thoroughbred horse came from behind to clinch the Kentucky Derby yesterday. Nyquist is heading to the Preakness. He's looking for that elusive triple crown.
For the EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Lauren Ashburn. Thank you for joining us. Good night and God bless.